G'day fans and we're back. Good old Dags and MPS here looking at Discovery episodes. Very exciting stuff. Episode four already. Oh my God, they're going through so quickly. <gasps> anyway, this particular episode is called Forget Me Not and we never like to be forgotten. Isn't that right, MPS? What did you think of the episode? I th it, it was so good. I sat up all night watching it over and over and over again. Um, look, I, I thought there were some really good bits in it. Um, some stuff that uh, we'll get on to later, which I don't think they've referenced before. So, um, yeah, let's see where this goes. Yeah, I love it. I like it at the very, very start. Even like As always, you know, there's all these little ro robots outside the ship fixing everything. It's like, okay, that's absolutely <laughs> fantastic. How come all the other ships never had those robots? What's the deal with that? But uh, I suppose there's the, they're the equivalent of the Star Wars Astromex, but let's not get into other swear words, shall we? So there you go. Um, I really like the opening sequence with uh, Gulba's uh, speech about how the crew is unhappy and miserable. And, of course, we referenced that uh, in the past episode or two, saying, well, you know, surely you've moved into the future. Not everybody's going to be happy about it. And clearly that's what's happening in this particular story, and they're actually bringing it to the forefront, which is kind of cool because in most other stories, they'll be going, yep, we're in the future and everybody's happy, and it's not the case at all. Yeah, it was good to see that um, uh, Detmer was not, not a happy girl for that little bit um and i did enjoy the fact that well a few things saru was asking the ship computer what to do and all of a sudden the voice changed yep. you know there was that sort of glitch and it's like whoa has the computer become more personal or what's the story there exactly well, the answer to that apparently is, and this is what you call, this is a trick nerds got, trick nerds got to love this. It's actually the uh, manifestation of the AI in, in the ship's computer called Zora, which, and you'd be thinking, where did I get that one from? Well, it's actually referenced in the Calypso episode of Short Treks because they find the discovery, I don't know, in the distant future and it's now got an AI and it's called Zora. And they reckon some fans think it's the first manifestation of Zora. And that's the reason why we have the silent movie at the end, uh, which we'll get to <laughs> probably enough uh, at the end. But anyway, that's the idea behind that. <laughs> Um, you're right. The whole Detmer thing has been sort of building up for a little while and the dinner scene. And I do agree with you. You know, Saru's trying to get the crew together and they're saying play board games and go do hopscotch and do this and do that. I mean, yeah. clearly all they need is a holodeck. But oh, my God, when Discovery was built, they didn't exist. But now they're in the 32nd century. There'd be holodecks everywhere, you'd think. Um, and that's sort of led into the, the dinner scene, which is probably one of the best moments uh, of the show mm. by a long shot where Detmer and the Stamets have a bit of a Bit of a bit of a Barney, as it were. If you're a bit of bad language, oh, yeah. everything. Oh, how good was that? <laughs> it was kind of it was kind of like a family Christmas all over again. You know, you sort of got that feeling where you know the drunk uncle and and the, the not so happy aunt and all that sort of stuff. But I've got to say, um, Philippa, what she's the perfect guest. She is just throwing out comments here and there and just going, well, whatever, picking up that foot thing to eat and and I reckon she'd be fantastic as a dinner guest. Forget the rest of them; they're all pretty boring. I mean, I you actually think about it afterwards. You're thinking, why was she even invited? I mean, no one really likes her. And it was just like, she was really the odd one out of the group. And you, yeah, you know, I mean, from a narrative perspective, like, yeah, it looks a bit of funny. She's there and she upsets the apple cart and, you know, does her bit. But realistically, it's like, no, nah, nah, sorry, uh, Philippa, you're not, not really welcome into this. This is all for the harmonious part of the crew. And she's not effectively part of the crew. So that was a bit of a, a bit of a left field sort of thing. But uh, um, yeah, was that was actually quite interesting. Um, it was weird to see that they were all in uniform and she wasn't. Yeah, you know, I know she's not part of the crew, but they could have all come casual. Yeah, it just yeah. doesn't seem like they have any sort of casual gear. You know, like it sort of seems that on Discovery, you just don't turn off. You're in uniform all the time, regardless. You know, and maybe that's part of the problem why they're not uh, having time to to unwind and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that dinner scene um, worked out really well. And of course, it just takes, I mean, I found the funny thing is that they operate as a crew. They're not really sort of like bonded as friends in a lot of ways. And I guess it's a bit of a, a weird sort of feeling. We've seen this in Star Trek before, especially in Star Trek 6, where it's just like, well, we're all together in this unusual environment. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're just going to gel from the outset. Right, you know, someone might crack a joke here and someone might crack a joke there. But for the most part, people are pretty quiet because they don't know what to say or what to do. Um, and 
I mean, this obviously leads into other things later on, but as soon as one person leaves the table, then, you know, which Stamets does, then others are going to start leaving at the same time. And I expected like, who's going to be the last person to say, well, all this food's still left here. I'm just going to tuck in and have a whale of a time. I thought, uh, you know, Giorgio might've done that, but it wasn't to be the case if I recall correctly. So, uh, but it was a very good scene though. And it was actually good that Detmer finally got to sort of unleash and say, uh, yeah, I piloted the ship and I've saved the ship and I've done this and I've done that and got no recognition for it whatsoever. Uh, and of course that brings up Stamets and his spore drive uh, thing yeah. as well. Which, which sort of leads to that point where, you know, when, when Tilly suggested using dark matter for it, he's turned around and go, no, well, I'm the spore drive. And it's like, well, it's, it's my ship and my ball and I'll go home if I have to. Yeah, I think he's got that feeling of, of, well, I'm important all of a sudden because I'm the only one who can do this. It's like, yeah, but you don't have to do it. That's the thing because, you die and the ship's screwed. So you're sort of stuck in the middle of nowhere. Well, so that was one thing that the show has been lacking for a little while. It's a good old Trekno babble. You know, oh, yeah, we've got the mycelium network and we've got dark matter. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it's like the audience is going, we've got no idea what you're talking about, but it sounds cool. As soon as you say dark matter, it's like, oh, that's got to be groovy no matter what it is. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, he's he's in charge of the spore drive. And it's, it, I think it gives him a purpose where he feels as though it gives him a purpose because he's in tr- charge of that. He doesn't want to let go. And ironically, Saru brought it up and saying well you know in in the real world it's called a spoff a single point of failure and if stomachs mm-hmm. gets knocked out then there's no one who can pilot the ship right who can actually steer it to different places so it does make sense that they would find a redundant system that would make it uh, work and uh, and of course in this show they just use the spore drive to okay we've got to go to go to trills like bing away you go and of course the thing now presents the story of saying well every man and his dog is going to be going hey this ship has got this new funky thing that lets it go anywhere Oh mate, we're gonna like get the bad guys onto that. So I would like to hope that at some point um, people start turning their attention to discovery, saying, "Yeah, we want that spore drive," because that is clearly the most important thing in the universe in terms of transportation uh, that we have. What do you reckon? Yeah. I reckon that they'll they'll end up in a situation where there'll be a couple of different ships. Uh, it'll be a confrontation. They'll go, "Well, we can't use warp to get out of here. We'll use a spore drive," and then people will go, "Hang on, where did it go?" And then they see it turn up later on. And that's when I think they'll be chasing the ship for the tech. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so that was like, there was an A and B story with this entire thing. And I guess that whole thing with the spore drive and the crew and everything was the B, the B story, which sort of resolved itself. Uh, I also like the idea that Michael and Gulba had a good conversation and, you know, we sort of worked out what Michael's problem is. She feels like she's responsible effectively for everybody. Mm. Uh, and if to a degree she is, she's the one to let him there. And of course things haven't worked out as well as they would have liked. So there's probably a little bit of like angst, from her point of view as well. That's why we thought it was interesting that when they get to go down a trill, Gull will find some really, really wussy excuses to go, no, Michael, you take it down there. It's like, he's the medical dude, but no, no, you take it down. She needs the moral support. It's like, uh, kind of not really, but you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, it's interesting. They called her a, res- a responsibility hoarder. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's, they've, they've pulled out a few interesting terms and sayings in this episode, you know, like, the, the morale of the of the, feder- of the group is when we find the Federation, you know, those five words, you know, some of that for those is really good. You know, when we find the Federation, we'll be back to normal and things will be right. And some are going, well, when we find the Federation, then what? So, yeah. you know, those five words right at the beginning of the episode made it um, mm. sort of seem important as to finding the Federation, yet it should be there. All you have yeah. to do is go back to the, to the dude who was sitting there in episode one and say, where's the Federation? Yeah, well, exactly right. It's like it's become this really, really big deal and it should be really quite obvious as to where it is. So we get down to the, like Trill, right? And we got all the, all, the, all, the, all the deities come out. And I thought straight away, it just reminded me of the original series of Star Trek, all the colours, you know, and there's reds and there's yellows and all this sort of stuff. It's like, oh my God, it's like, it's just a colour overload. Um, and it did follow the typical dare I say, Star Trek trope, where you got all these dignitaries. Some will say, yes, we want to help Adira. Some will say, no, we don't want to help Adira. And there's one in the middle that goes, yeah, no, nah, bugger off, we don't want you at all. So and it's like, <laughs> there's never a situation where they all agree and they just go, yep, done. Either keep it or get rid of it half and half. And then this whole thing of like, you know, they're going to try and sneak away and they get like um, sprung in the, in, the, in the forest thing and they've got to shoot dudes and whatever else. It's like, yeah, right. And there's one dude willing to help them, as is always the case, eh? I got to say that it was interesting to see Michael turn around. She's surrounded by three of them. And next thing you know, she's, she's kicked and punched the first two dudes and then shot the other one straight away. No questions asked. It's not like, you know, in, in next gen, they would have turned around and said, we have to come up with a diplomatic solution. She just went, screw this, bang, you're down. Get rid of these guys and just move on because, you know, she was pretty clear in the fact that they were not taking them back to the shuttlecraft. I think the 
idea of how the story worked, a lot of people really dialed into it. Uh, the whole thing with the deer and the previous hosts and the tile and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, people who look at all the previous hosts and go, oh, there's a dude there in a, like a, a, fed, uh, a next generation era uniform for like the, from mm-hmm. the card series or whatever else. And they're trying to work out who everybody else is and work out the time frame. And they said, okay, well, you know, it's been like 800 years later and she's got so many hosts. So some of those hosts clearly had a pretty good lifespan. So um, I thought it worked well from that perspective uh, in terms of getting the story across and the introduction of a previous host, Gray. But as to whether the thing gelled together, uh, some fans are really dialing into it and others are not so much. I'm a little confused in that because, yeah, you saw the you saw several of them and they may have been all of them that were the previous hosts. But then Michael says she understood the message. I was like, what message? I didn't hear a message. I didn't see a message. I didn't reference a message in any of that. Yeah, I think the idea being that um, when you're going, when you're uh, going to take on a, a symbiont, right? It has to be uh, both parties have to be willing to do it and have to agree to do it and go, "Yep, that's okay." Whereas in the scenario that we had, when Gray was mortally wounded, and there's a funny story about that, uh, and the symbiont got transferred over to Adira, it wasn't by choice. It was like, "Oh, it's got to be done. Just do it." Right? And there's clearly a disconnect between the two entities, and this particular mm-hmm. sequence sort of merge those two entities together. So the symbiont now understood who Adira was, Adira knew, understood who Tal was, and they became a harmonious pairing. That's how the whole Trill thing works, right? Um, and from then on, you can say, okay, now she can access the memories and access the previous hosts. And in theory, what should happen now is Adira should act as a different person, just like Zed- Jadzia mm-hmm. did uh, back in her time. So still has the personality of the host, but the memories of the of the symbiont sort of like if affect the way they sort of operate and move. Um, it's very funny. Some fans have picked up and they think, and I don't know if you picked up on this, like when Gray got originally injured in the in the in the ship crash uh, with the with the rock hitting it and all the rest of it. Um, and it's like, where's the EMH when you need one? It's like you know, it's like uh, state please state the nature of the medical emergency instead of some robot thing flying around in the thirty second century. And people said, hang on. It's not that bad an injury. Surely you can fix it up, you know, just a bit of band-aids and a couple of aspirin and you'll be cooking on gas. So some people thought, and I agree with this, that Gray should have died from the outset, right, Uh, rather than just be mortally wounded because that was a pretty weak way of going about it. And maybe Mm. using an EMH, uh, which from a bedside manners perspective, you know, they can improve the personality, would have been much better than just having this robot flying above going, hey, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and and whatever else. Maybe generation ships don't have those, but... uh, uh, that seemed to be a bit of a, a weak flaw in the story. I don't know. And look, maybe they got a, they took away the, the holograms because mm-hmm. who knows? You know, like you said, maybe that's only for Federation ships and it wasn't a Federation ship. Well, it, it's actually mentioned as a generation ship. And this is actually something from science fiction books and stories from way back when with the idea being that travel is so distant that you put families and stuff on a ship, you send it off on a one-way trip and then you know, the, the communities breed and they just go on for generation after generation after generation. And of course, in this timeline, as there are no dilithium crystals, they can't warp drive anywhere. So if they want to sort of say, oh, we want to get to planet XYZ, which is going to take us 50, oh, more than that, about 300 years to do it, clearly people are going to be born and die on that ship. And that's the idea of what this ship was. So uh, it just got touched on when they just said it was a generational ship, but they didn't get into the details of it. So it, to a large degree, you could argue that the whole Star Trek universe at this point in time has gone backwards to pre like pre enterprise era when there was actually even before that when there was just like no warp drive whatsoever so it's really really gone old school so it's like using you know sailing ships in in the modern age so yeah. it was actually quite interesting so uh, and then and then the whole idea that he's now a ghost boyfriend you know yeah that, yeah that that's funny isn't it I I saw that at the end and the first thing I thought of and I know I'm not the only one who's thought this uh, it's straight out of Battlestar Galactica with Baltar and Number Six where it was like yeah. you know only uh, Adira can see Gray and hear Gray and all the rest of it, and Gray's going to be talking in her head and all this sort of thing. And, and it was like it just had that really interesting feel about it. And uh, yeah, I thought it was nice, probably for the story, but as to whether it made a great deal of sense is, is probably questionable. Um, and of course, the other thing it now introduces is to whether anybody can be a host of a symbiont. Uh, mm. So uh, humans obviously received it; it's worked. They've gone to the pool and got the, the, the nuts and bolts sorted out. So who else can be a host? And they've got symbionts running around everywhere in the pools. Maybe they can just start plucking dudes out of their front and center and say, here you go, <laughs> get yourself an alien. <laughs> and you put on gas. So there you go. Now, what did you think about the whole idea that they're showing the um, Buster Keaton movie, uh, uh, Sherlock Jr. Uh, at the end? Um, what did you? What were your thoughts on when you saw that? Because I have a very interesting opinion on that. I like the idea that it was a, 
a hol holodeck, a holo, um, hologram type image. But seriously, again, all in their uniforms, standing and sitting and laughing too much. Surely they should have seen other stuff or, or something like that in the past. It's not like movies stopped being made in the 21st century and that was it. It is a very good point. A lot of people have put up the fact that, you know, you're watching a film that even by our standards today, nobody would watch and laugh at uh, because it was for a time in the 1920s and the slapstick and all the rest of it. And it worked then because it was all new and unique. But a thousand plus years in the future is not going to have the same impact on the audience. And if anything, the audience would be looking at it, just watching it, stone facing and Yeah, I, I, I can't relate. Because you've got to remember, too, they're looking at all this technology of cars and cities and things. They just can't relate to any of it. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. They don't know what the, half these things are. So I agree with you. It's cute for the story, for the episode, that they're using a Buster Keaton movie, but it doesn't make a great deal of sense. You'd almost be picking better off picking a modern-day comedy, uh, something that you know, with a bit of dialogue that people can actually sort of connect in with and uh, where the characters actually exist rather yeah. than a song. Well, remembering they're only what is it, 300 years old to the film, the fact that all the aliens on there wouldn't know what a car is and yeah. wouldn't understand slapstick, you know. So Saru's standing there going, oh, I don't get this. Why mm. I don't understand why it's funny. That's fine. And it's like, yeah, you're right. It, yeah. it doesn't make any sense to have just that sort of going. You know, maybe a, a Roadrunner cartoon would have been funnier. Yeah, well, it's kind of funny, isn't it? Because it's not like you're watching the thing and you go, oh, that's a good one. As in, like, we, the audience, are looking at, oh, that Buster Keaton movie, yeah, that's a good one. They're going to love that because most of the audience watching Discovery, that episode, be going, I've never even seen uh, Sherlock uh, Jr. So even they wouldn't know what it is. So maybe there'll be, like, a huge run now on YouTube of people trying to find this episode <laughs> of, of Sherlock Jr. And, and go, oh, my God, silent movies suddenly find themselves a new audience. But uh, um, yeah. anyway, look, it was cute. But to a large degree, yeah, that didn't make a great deal of sense. So anyway, we need to rate it, MPS. So this is a very, very exciting episode. Very, very cool. So for this wonderful episode, whose name I've completely forgotten, forget me not, what <laughs> is your rating, sir? <laughs> you forgot the movie title called Forget Me Not. Um, I'm going to give it three and a half stars. Very good, mate. Very cool. From my point of view, uh, actually, funny enough, I've gone for three and a half as well. I think the biggest issue the film, uh, the film, the biggest issue the show had is that Adira got introduced last week. This week, mm. she's the center point of the entire episode, and everybody has to be hooked into her emotional turmoil with Gray and the, and the symbiote and all the rest. But the problem is that she hasn't been in the show long enough. I mean, most of the other crew have been around for since the beginning of episode one of season one. And it's almost like within one episode, we've got to feel this emotional connection with her and the symbiote and all the saga that she's having. I think had they sort of stretch it for about five or six more episodes, you get to learn more about Adira's stress and her concerns and her issues and then get the symbiote thing sorted out with Grey. That may have had a bigger emotional impact. I think they're trying to invest too much too soon in the character. But on the other side, think, sorry, go on. I was going to say, I think they needed to, to shift the fo focus from uh, the older short-haired lady to the younger short haired girl, you know, so short haired people, you know, in terms of females, you know, we've missed the engineer for a couple of episodes. She hasn't been around and a deer has been put into place. And yeah, it just looks like they've gone, well, you're out this week. We're going to sub in Adira, and then next episode Adira's is out yeah. and we'll bring her back in for an issue. Yeah, uh, I did notice that Reno's been missing for a couple of episodes, and apparently the reason is that the actress herself doesn't actually want to appear in every episode, just called upon when she's absolutely needed, which is a bit unfortunate because you would have thought she'd be grouse at the dinner table, but anyway, it wasn't to be. <laughs> um, and what but what did work in the show's favour was the whole dealing with the PTSD with the crew. Uh, that, I think, worked. That was actually one of the strongest bits. So, uh, And the fact that um, they're all acknowledging that they've got a few issues and the fact that Detmer tells Gulba that she's got some problems. I reckon that was actually really, really good. And it's good that they're addressing that uh, because you could easily just bypass it and pretend that everybody's happy when they're, uh, when they're not. So uh, yeah. there you go. How good is I, that? I found it really interesting when Paul and Detmer hugged at the end. Yeah. Paul had his hands closed on her and she had her hands open like a proper yeah that's i need that sort of thing and yeah. he's got his hands closed and it's, it sort of felt like there was a bit of i'm still not willing to be completely open to you about the whole thing so yeah we'll see how that pans out i guess indeed but uh, otherwise we'll worry about that for next week because the next week i mean there's no reason now they got to nick off to the federation where will that be you thought at the end of this episode they might say oh look where it is it's just up the road we know exactly where that is but they didn't say anything at all so i reckon we'll be hanging out 
to see what uh, that's all about. So in the interim, we'll be back in a few days' time. How good is that to uh, discover a bit more about Discovery? So in the interim, make sure you keep on trekking. Bye for now. <laughs>